So much of the Bible could have been written with climate crisis in mind. Take the, the builders on the sand and the rock. One took notice, one ignored the climate that they could not simply fix. Then there's the apocalyptic messages in the Gospels about the nations perplexed by the, the roaring of the sea. And the widespread acknowledgement of the fragility and finitude of creation. Everything comes to an end, though alongside that, the robustness and resilience of creation which we have not only taken for granted but blithely misrepresented as everlasting and indestructible. Now I hope you grasp the huge difference there. Life is going to be tough otherwise, let alone getting to the end of this sermon. So much of the Bible could have been written with climate crisis in mind, but especially the book of Job. This story of a good and innocent human being beset by the most appalling loss and suffering and then having to endure the fake wisdom of those who presented themselves as the friends who know better. That smug, no smoke without fire attitude which Jesus so often went so far out of his way to contradict. Now when you compare the maps of what we call the global north, aka the richer countries, and the global south, the maps of who and where will be hit first and hardest by climate change, these maps are almost mirror images. Likewise, the maps of who emits the most and least greenhouse gases. There's an underlying truth then to no smoke without fire, but the smoke you might be choking on comes from the fire that powers your neighbour's industry. So, of course, that smoke, if you keep pumping it out, eventually spreads and chokes everybody. I'm aware of the weakness of a purely global view, though. Within the wealthy countries, including the UK, there are internal layers of justice and extreme inequality. A refugee squirming under the accusations of a professionally incredulous border guard cannot be blamed for the saltwater inundation of the homes of our sisters and brothers in Christ in the Pacific Islands, or, or the droughts, or the wildfires, which are now accelerating beyond any normality that we have counted on since the last Ice Age. Don't ever let care of the homeless on the streets of our towns in the winter be an alternative to campaigning for a just transition from our bondage to oil and gas. And any acknowledgement of the responsibility we share as nations will be in tandem with, absolutely not in competition with, setting our own house in order with regard to justice and human rights and compassion. Be compassionate, says Jesus, as your Father in heaven is compassionate, personally, globally, locally. Now, if by any chance the God who's portrayed in that fascinating theological novel we call the book of Job is the same as the one Jesus called Father, then compassion as a minimum involves and is seen in keeping faith with fellow creatures who suffer despite all that might come between us. Which also is why attending to poverty and attending to the desecration of nature must never be presented as competing aims. Both of these things are allowed to persist because they're both caused by injustice or disorder. Things being out of place, which, like the wind and the waves on the Sea of Galilee, require an active positive intervention to find their balance. Like other predators, we are God's gift to the earth to make things better. At every level, no one is exempt. Even and especially the perspective of the downtrodden is a gift to those who are about to discover that pride does come before a fall. When the nations meet at COP in Glasgow in November, the voice of the poorest will be the most valuable of all. By which I don't mean to say that to be poor or to suffer makes you right or makes you wise. Suffering is bad, full stop. But the voice of those who suffer 
needs to be heard so that all may discern a way forward. All. All is a creation-inclusive word. We think of the groaning of creation, the desperation of the refugee, the outrage of those who lose their homes because we are addicted to fossil fuels. And of course, it's all urgent. Like Jesus' healing of the chronically sick woman in the synagogue, others said, go away, come back another day. Jesus got on with it. The book of Job is not easy reading, and so it's probably good to receive it in chunks as we're doing today. Think of it, think through together, but it, it nurtures in us a very realistic, very mature sort of faith in a God who, despite having more on their plate than, and far greater agendas than our own, nonetheless cares and respects justice and decency. It suggests God might even take pride in us when we intend the best. How many Christians actually dare to have that positive thought? Job is a book which is quite useless to those who reject God because they've just stubbed their toe, or, or indeed to those who act as if the universe must revolve around them. In that sense, during the centuries in which even churches have taught that Earth and every single other creature was made merely for our benefit, no one will have made much sense of Job at all, except as an example of forlorn and pious hope. I know that my Redeemer lives. Fine, but can they get on with this redemption stuff? Psalm 13. How long, O Lord? How long? Job is even more pointless to those who are convinced that their own good fortune is down to them alone. Jesus himself acknowledges that life is hard, but his strongest words are reserved for those who add to that hardness, or, or, or sit back when they could intervene to soften the blow. If we really do read the Gospels, how can we come away with any idea other than that greatness, health, wealth, and good fortune that comes our way is for the good of the earth? Greatness and power, then, are always, always, by definition, abused if they are not put at the service of fellow creatures who are excluded or driven from their habitats or denied justice. I speak of a mature faith as one which is not intimidated by the peevish naivety with which puerile vengefulness and twisted logic insists that suffering and disaster, and even if they're bothered to take note of such things, the climate crisis, that this is reason enough to abandon faith altogether or to despise and pity those who hang on. They probably despise and pity all the more those who in these days find new hope and help in the friendship of Jesus Christ. Now people still give me funny looks when they ask for resources to do with climate change and I refer them to scripture. Or I suggest that Christian faith which grew up as a spiritual response to disaster and threat, is our first, our greatest resource to build up the resilience we're going to need for the changes which undoubtedly do lie ahead. To Job, as God speaks to him out of the whirlwind, as well as through the birds in the heavens and the fish in the sea, to Job there is, first of all, that difficult patch to get through. It's difficult to see mercy and love in a God who tries to convey, even in love, that, that, that liberating truth of human limits. That truth, the good news of human limits. Even if, even if we do work out the mechanisms and relations of the planet, we are no less dependent on them than Job was. We may have worked out ways to manipulate nature, and certainly the science which translates nature's voice into warnings we should long ago have acted on does that. But God's speech to Job, setting him and humanity in our place as creatures amongst creatures rather than rulers, as part rather than purpose of creation, that remains completely valid, contemporary and coherent, expressed as it is in that highly sophisticated communication technology which we call poetry, which of course refuses to treat any of God's creatures as soulless, inert objects, but uses the language of feeling and sensitivity and the capacity for communion 
for every single one? Can you look creation in the eye and still carry on the way we are? This mature yet childlike way of thinking is one we grow out of at our peril. That's why devotional language and actions like the bell ringing for climate justice with which we'll conclude today, they gain power because they, they plug into a real robust and open relationship with the earth and our fellow creatures. Predators and prey, sharers in God-given habitat. We confuse the staggeringly detailed descriptions that science offers of mechanisms and networks of creation with explanations. But the measurements that we as a species have done must enable the downtrodden earth to speak to the leaders of the nations in Glasgow in November. I have confidence that the COP conference will do some good. I expect it will not do enough. But I'm thanking God for the sign of hope that COP represents and reminding the churches we need to be something different when the circus has come and gone. There is talk of a billion dollars to help with adaptation and coping with the damage which has already been done. But for each one of us, never underestimate your conversations, your support for the elected leaders to do the right thing and choose a better life for all despite the blocked horizon of upfront costs. Never underestimate the value of your devotionally irrational hope and joy. This smile that I've been told I have no right to wear on my face as environmental chaplain. As Jesus makes clear, and as some of you I know will have discovered, as does almost every church that gets into what eco-congregation is about, to respond in faith and concrete action to the challenges we face leads to a deepening of faith and an enrichment of fellowship. We discover daily all the more what this church business is really for to offer leadership, service, friendship, and greatness as Jesus showed it. As people amongst people, creatures amongst creatures, not dictatorially in charge, but making the difference of the yeast in the dough. We find, therefore, in the midst of global crisis and facing more, a God who, having put us in a place with the truth in love, then keeps faith with us as we respond in whatever way is given to us. Amen. Thank you.